Okay, so let's start. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Dejan Mitrovic, and I'm a lead software engineer at free to move here in Berlin. And I'm going to be talking about the world after microservice migration with service mesh and contract testing. So we're going to talk about how and why we split our monolithic system and what, happens, what happened afterwards. What were, what were the, the errors, that, the problems that we encountered, and how we solved them. So this is the brief ag uh, agenda. First, I'm going to talk about the uh, motivation, again, why we did what we did. And then we're going to deep dive into the service mesh concept and contract testing and see how they fit into this whole microservice ecosystem. So one of the things my company does is uh, uh, car sharing aggregation. So the idea is that you have one app for all these car, uh, scooter, bike sharing providers. And we had to integrate them somehow into our system. So when you are a startup, of course, you want to deliver as fast as you can, and you don't care about the uh, technical depth that you're creating that's going to come back afterwards and bite you in the arse. So this is what happened here, exactly like in, in many companies around here. So all these providers were implemented inside of a monolith, but not just a regular monolith, but from my personal wor uh, view, the, the worst kind. So each of the providers was implemented as a separate library and then hooked into the, into the main system. So this creates, later on, this creates problems when you want to debug stuff. You have to like, change the library, publish the code, reimport the library, test it, you see it crashes, then do it again, and so on. But this was not the main point why we started doing all this. So the problem was that you would clean, test, check everything locally, and you will see everything's fine. Afterwards, you deploy your system, and two hours later, you get class not found exception. And you're like, what's going on? So the, one of the problems is that we use Scala, and um, all these libraries use slightly different versions of third-party libraries. So usually this is not a problem, but in Scala, you change from version 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, and everything is like wrong. The package names are different, half of the classes are missing, and that library is doing something completely else now. So not a lot of attention was paid when this was developed. So we have to fix this somehow, right, to split this monolith. So we observed it as kind of a black box. And so what kind of requests are coming into it? And we, we saw that we can somehow group them into two categories. So there are requests that uh, work with multiple providers, like you want to fetch vehicles for providers given in the query parameter. And then there are requests that work with single provider, like you want to create a booking to book a particular car. And after analyzing this, uh, we proposed an architecture that looks something like this. So nothing fancy. There is an initial gateway component, which you call, which determines whether the call goes directly to the provider or goes to the aggregator component. So the first one will go to the aggregator, the second one will go to the provider directly. And then the aggregator simply like uh, wraps up this uh, uh, query string, calls in the individual providers, assembles the JSON, and gives back to the, the result. Again, nothing fancy, but we had, a, we had a requirement that all this should be very dynamic. So initially, we would set up the gateway and the aggregator, and all the traffic would go to the monolith. As we extract one provider, the traffic should just start slowing to that new provider. And eventually, there will be no traffic going to the backend, to the monolith, and we can just remove it. At the same time, uh, people are adding new providers. So again, as I develop new provider, I deploy it. I immediately want to see it in the, in the app. I don't want to change any enums, any configuration files, or, or stuff like that. So we need a kind of a dynamic routing to support this. And this is what, where service mesh came into place. So we started looking what's there, and we found this, this concept, which could be defined as follows. I, I'll take a quote from this website. So service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service communications safe, fast, and reliable. So what are the options, the functionalities to say uh, offered by the service mesh? So the core functionalities are dynamic routing, what we needed, load balancing, retriable failures, circuit breaking, and distributed tracing and metrics. So these are all the things that you need in a 
in a microservice architecture in the long run. None of these con concepts are new, of course. So, for example, dynamic routing we could do by setting up a service directory and then having the aggregator check in the service directory where is this uh, service located and then make the call, call there. But the point of the service mesh is that you want to extract all this behavior away from your service and let the infrastructure do it. Okay? So in our, <coughs> in our code, we don't have any connections to the service directories. We don't have any libraries for circuit breaking, distributed tracing and metrics that's a whole other topic, but this is all covered, again, by the service mesh. And uh, currently, there are a lot of, I'll not say a lot of, but several uh, implementations on the service mesh. The one that we are going to cover is called Linkerd. So when, s when we started this project over a year ago, Linkerd was the only production-ready service mesh implementation that didn't require uh, your system running on Kubernetes. So we, back then we were running on AWS, ECS, and Linkerd fulfilled all our needs. Uh, currently, there are two branches of Linkerd. Uh, the first one, branch one, is the one we're going to cover here. The second branch has been released some three months ago. We'll mention it a bit later and how it compares to other solutions and to the first version here. So we will deal with Linkerd version one here. Okay, so how do you deploy a service mesh in, in your infra infrastructure? So there are several, several ways. The first one is so-called host-only mode, where you deploy Linkerd as a component on the host of your systems, let's say uh, uh, EC2 node. And then all the services are basically talking to this Linkerd instance, and it does what it needs to do. Uh, another approach is so-called so sidecar. So sidecar means that you are uh, deploying a single Linkerd instance along with your services. So, and you can do this in two ways, as an outgoing or incoming. Uh, as an outgoing, so your service talks to Linkerd, and then Linkerd uh, talks to the target service, which again talks to the, uh, Linkerd and so on. And in this way, you can, for example, achieve <laughs> dynamic routing. The other thing is that external entities never, call, never talk to your service directly, but instead they talk to Linkerd, which forwards the request to your service. In this way, you can, for example, measure the response time of your services and so on. So you don't have the dynamic routing per se. And of course, you can combine the two and get the best of both, uh, best of both worlds. You know, why would you do this? For example, there are quite a bit of... Um, HTTP headers that Linkerd generates and passes through. So if you have a setup like this, there is a specific header called CTX trace, which then can be used by Zipkin, and you use this to, to show the call graph of your services. So you get this for free. These are generated by, Li by Linkerd. Of course, nothing is done, uh, done automatically, so your service has to forward them in any calls that it makes, but eventually, you can export this to Zipkin and see how everything is working, what, what are the bottlenecks in your call graphs, and so on. Now let's see how Linkerd is working. Um, there are several steps in this whole process. The first is identification. So we have this post request as an example, which uses our uh, fictional drive to move uh, provider, and we want to send a login request. So how does Linkerd identify this request and allow you to, to process it later on. There is basically a configuration file in, each, in which you can set the identifiers. So one of the identifiers is called the header token. It basically looks in one of the headers in your request. By default, it's the host. So if you set up an uh, identifier like this, this request will be identified as slash service slash free to move. So it just takes the, the host name of your, of your request. The second possible identifier is, is the path. So it looks at the request path. You can tell it how many segments you want to check, in this case two, and whether you want to consume the request or uh, the, to consume the segments when you forward the, the request or not. So in this case, my uh, call will be identified as service providers drive to move. 
If I say consume to true, what the services will eventually receive is the login part only. Okay? This is one of the very few identifiers that can be used to modify the incoming request. There is also method and path, so your request will be identified like this, uh, HTTP 1.1, post, and then free to move, and so on. There are a lot of other identifiers. The documentation is very well written. You can see how they work. You can write your own, but whatever you find there suits for, for suitable for mo most cases. Now, once you have the, the, the identifier, the second step is so-called binding. So you process this identifier of the request and assign it to some so-called client name. This is done using, using the delegation tab. So these are the set of rules that will be applied to your identifier to figure out where the uh, traffic needs to be routed. Uh, the priority is from bottom to top. So the bottom most has the highest priority. And let's say we have identifier like this from the previous slide. It takes two segments and the request is written up there. So how does this work in practice? So the identifier that we have is service provider drive to move. Uh, let me use this. And then linkerd goes and tries to match this part here to the left part written here. So it cannot match service to vehicles, that fails, but it can match service providers to service providers. And then this part is rewritten to this part. So this ID becomes SVC, okay? And then we have SVC and drive to move as a left follower. And now the process starts from, uh, from the beginning. So SVC drive to move cannot be matched to this, cannot be matched to this, but matches this. And then it's replaced by console slash demo and the uh, end result is this. So once Linkerd encounters uh, a hashtag or a dollar sign, it stops the, the binding mode. As you can see, Linkerd supports many different kinds of namers, as they are called. This is console, a service directory. It works with Kubernetes API, it works with Zookeeper, and so on. And uh, you can basically configure it through a configuration file. And this is the last step, the resolution. So once we have a name, which references console, how do we get the IP addresses of the services to which we need to forward the call? And these are so-called namers. So I'm telling here, I have a console namer, which is at this address and this port. And basically, Linkerd will ping it, get these IP addresses. Let's say I have multiple instances of the services. It will pick one of those and send a request there. Uh, what happens if console does not have this? Uh, entry in its registry, the, oh, the process continues. So this has failed here, and then Linkerd tries to satisfy this branch. This means that the request should be forwarded exactly to this IP or host name at this port. And by having a configuration like this, this is how we actually managed to develop the uh, dynamic routing we had before. So all the new services were put into console, and then Linkerd checks if they are in console, I send a request there. If they are not in console, I just send everything to the legacy backend and hope it can uh, handle the request. There are many more details. Again, the documentation is very well written. You can uh, modify uh, many of these steps and um, configure Linkerd to work the way you need it. Uh, another qu one question that arises is, is what are the penalties for, penalties for using these intermediate components into your architecture? Uh, on this website, you have like um, hints how to fine tune and optimize Linkerd. And with the optimize instance, this is the performance penalty that you get. So in 1,000 requests a second, P99 is five milliseconds. So it behaves nicely up to 20,000 requests a second. You get six milliseconds of delay. Afterwards, it goes a bit higher, but you can use additional instances and so on. So we are still far away from 20,000 requests a second, so we don't care about this. It's fine for us. OK, let's do a bit of a demo. So I have a Docker Compose file. 
which configures console, Linkerd, and two instances of our service, and then we see how this all works in practice. Uh, with console, I won't go into, into too many details. The documentation, again, is very good. There are, it's described how you can deploy it on AWS, how you can deploy it on uh, Kubernetes if you need it, and so on. But the interesting thing here is the registrator. So as you are deploying services, how do they appear in, in, in console? And uh, once you shut them down, how do you remove them from console? You can set, uh, do this via your deployment pipeline, but there is this nice little tool called Registrator. It basically hooks into Docker, listens to events, and whenever there is a new component, new container starting, it scans for the exposed ports and then registers these ports with the console. And this works very nicely. We start a service, it's in console, we kill it, it's out, out of console. You can configure Registrator using this Environment variables like service underscore ignore means don't put the service into the into console because I don't want console in console, right? Um, there is a linker D configuration. Um, we can check it quickly. So this is basically what I show you in slides. There is an admin port. There is a telemetry information, so Linkerd works with Prometheus. Out of the box, you can collect all kinds of information about your services. We've set up the console namer and the routers, delegation table, and so on. Ah, sorry. Is there anything else in the Docker Compose that's interesting? Yeah, and we have two services. Uh, two instances of the same service, we call it the echo service. And we're gonna see how uh, Linkerd communicates with them. So let's start this. Um, this is just a Docker Compose app. We wait until everything is set up. All good so far. Now it's all good. Uh, so how do you use Linkerd? The, the easiest way is just to set up the HTTP proxy environment variable like this. So I say HTTP proxy is localhost 4040, which is the default, force, uh, default port for Linkerd. And then just I make a request to echo service ping. And uh, Traffic goes out there, and the service responds with echo two. I can do the same thing. Now I see that the second service has responded. So we see here the load balancer in practice. Uh, by default, Linkerd takes it receives from console, let's say, a set of services. It picks two of those, and then based on the algorithm, chooses to which one to forward the traffic. So let's see how the load balancer works in practice. We can put some, of the, uh, some delay into one of these services and then see how Linkerd will choose one of them to which to route the traffic. So let's go to the Docker Compose file. In this echo service, we will say delay 100 milliseconds. And in the second one, sorry, we will say, lay, say delay is 500 milliseconds but start with a delay after you receive 50 requests. So initially it works fine, after 50 requests it will slow down dramatically. We save this, and run the thing again. And in here I have a small script which just loops 100 times and calls the echo service. I'll use the break for some water. And let's hope this works. Echo service, delay loop. Hmm. It doesn't work. <laughs> it worked on my machine before. <laughs> let's, let's do it again. If it doesn't work this time, you have to trust me that it works. <laughs> mm. 
did I put correct delays in echo service here? One and 500, okay. Yeah. Oh, could be, could be. Let's see. Oh. Uh, it's there, 500 milliseconds. Oh, it means after 50 calls. Yeah, uh, just 50 calls. Okay. Let's do it again. Ah, it works. Let's pretend this is the first time I run this call. And uh, we can edit the video afterwards, right? So, and cut the first part. Okay. So, how did it work? It first called the, the first one, then its second one, it saw the second one is responding faster, and then it just continued calling the second one. After approximately 50 calls, the second one started delaying, and it fall back to the, last, to the first one. You see, from time to time, it tries to ping the second instance to see if it recovered, but it continues call, calling the, the first. So this is, again, something you get out of the box, and in most cases, 50% of the cases, it works as expected. Uh, there are, again, all kinds of different load balancers. You can check them. It's all very well documented. And, yeah. Um, before I said that Linkerd can be deployed as a sidecar, uh, although it can be deployed, it doesn't mean it should be deployed. It's um, not really lightweight. In our production system, we've been monitoring, and an instance uses around 350 megabytes, let's say. So you have, if you have two instances, which each of your services, that's 700 megabytes more, which I'm not sure you really want to do, even with all the benefits. So they kind of approached this problem again and redesigned the, the, the whole system, and this is what they came up with. So now Linkerd is split into two parts. One is called control plane, the other one is called data plane. So control plane handles all the configuration, all the settings, connection with Prometheus, Grafana, and so on. And the component that you actually deploy with your services is very lightweight. So they mentioned some 10 megabytes or so. So here, you just get the proxy, reverse proxy, whatever, and all the configuration is deployed only once in your Kubernetes cluster. Starting with this branch, they work exclusively with Kubernetes. Um, so no AWS or other cloud providers anymore. Of course, Linkerd is not the only one. Um, there is Istio, and to be honest, uh, from what I read on the web and from the vibe in this conference, I think Istio has become the synonym for service mesh. Even Linkerd, I think, was there before. Production ready, Istio is kind of taking over because Istio started with this approach from the start. So they had the control plane with all the like heavy stuff and have lightweight proxies which you deploy to in your application. Um, others are also trying to catch up. There is a Kong. If you're using Kong as in the API gateway, which we do, uh, they have announced in, from the version one, they are also gonna support something called Do uh, Kong Mesh, but you will also be able to use Istio as part of Kong. Uh, funny enough, Consul is also pushing into the service mesh uh, ecosystem. They have something called uh, Consul Connect, which takes the Envoy from Istio and then Consul can work as a service mesh on its own, so you don't need uh, any other parts. Uh, like I said, these two are still like betas being tested, Istio is production ready, it can be used on Kubernetes. As you can see, this uh, service mesh area is quite live, a lot of things happening, and then yeah, we'll see what, what happens next. This is the final architecture that we have, that, that we had. So basically there is a console instance, there is an entry, entry level, let's say, linker D, it uh, asks the console about the services, talks to the legacy monolith directly, or forwards the information to the aggregator. Aggregator has one of its own Linkerd instances deployed as a sidecar. And in the ECS cluster, we have these EC2, EC2 instances. I don't see my point, oh, here it is. And each of the instances, EC2 instances has the registrator, which then just push, pushes the information to console. Uh, once we were done with this, uh, we decided to move from AWS to Kubernetes, and all this works out of the box. So Linkerd can hook into the Kubernetes API, 
we don't need console anymore because we have the naming system in Kubernetes, but we still use console as it works nicely as a key value store. So we, we use it to store runtime configuration of our services there. And it has an S API which can, let's say, notify you when there are configura uh, configurational changes so you can update your services on the fly. You don't have to redeploy or restart them. Yeah, that's about it about on service meshes. Uh, the next point is consumer-driven contract testing. So the question is, when you are splitting the monolith, how do you keep the legacy systems running? So this is something we have to take care of. Uh, all our mobile applications should continue working as before, even though we are splitting the, the service. And later on, if you are redeploying the services, how do you make sure that you are not breaking the contracts that you have to, with your consumers? So this is all the, the point of consumer-driven contract testing. Let's have one example. Let's say that we have one, uh, oh, here it is. Let's say that we have one service, which is called vehicle booking, which knows how to book vehicles on behalf of users. This vehicle booking has two external clients. It has the mobile client, which the user actually uses, and it has business intelligence, which is like, let's say, our internal department wants to see, keep traps of booking and so on. And this vehicle booking talks directly to our fictional drive to move provider, which is outside. And then, how do we work with this vehicle booking service? How do we do end to end testing with we, when we have? external dependencies, so we cannot just you know, book cars and open doors and so on, it doesn't work. And when we are de deploying this, how do we make sure we don't break our clients and that business intelligence can get their data? Uh, to do the contract testing, we are using the PACT framework. PACT framework is specification of contracts and also has the implementation for various other languages. Uh, these are the languages and frameworks that are supported. So Ruby, JVM, Go, etc. If your favorite language is not here, there are still possibilities on how to use it. There are some tools and uh, you have to do some JSON writing yourself, but, but that's more or less it. Um, let's just go back to this picture and introduce some, uh, some terminology first. So a contract between two services or two entities basically describes how the requests look like and what are the expected formats of responses. So it says, if I send you this request, I expect this kind of a response. Um, in our case, it will be simple JSON files. Then uh, we will identify two types of contracts. One is, one is downstream. So vehicle booking has one downstream contract with drive to move and it has two upstream contacts, contracts with a mobile client and with business intelligence. And then consumer-driven contract testing means that contracts are defined from the point of view of the client. So the client defines the contracts and tells the provider, okay, I want you to behave like this. And then the provider takes that and implements it. Okay, uh, we switch to another demo. Let's just look at the API of this vehicle booking. So it has two clients. A mobile client does a post to the bookings, it sends the user ID and the car ID, and receives a booking ID as a response. But there is bad request uh, 500 to catch all. And the BI has a different endpoint that they are calling, so there is a get bookings user ID, and it re uh, the client receives all the bookings for this user. Nothing fancy, but it will serve our purpose. So, uh, when we are, uh, okay, let's just zoom this in. We are now building the vehicle booking service, and one thing we want to do is write a client that will call the, the external provider. So this is just a lightweight client, lightweight wrap around the HTTP library. Any Scala developers here? Scala developers? No? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Hopefully we have more Scala developers after this talk. So nothing big going on here. The drive to move client just receives the URL and the HTTP client instance, sets up the booking URL and just posts whatever it receives, uh, posts the booking request and receives a booking response as a result, wrapped in some effect. And now how do we write unit tests for this? 
and see how, so I will write a unit test and see how it fits into all of these contract testing stuff. So we will be testing behavior of uh, drive to move client and we say it should, I don't know, book a car for a user. We will uh, set up the request body and response body. So request body, this is a literal string in Scala. It will have a user ID, which will be user123, and it will have car ID, which will be car123. And, oop, this should not be all. Resp oop, response body will be booking ID, which is booking123. Okay. This is what we are going to send. This is what we're going to expect. And now we are writing a contract using this a bit dramatic forge pact command. And we are forging a pact between uh, vehicle booking and uh, drive to move. And now we are adding the interactions between these two services. So I'm adding an interaction which has a description. Uh, book a car for a, for a user and we say upon receiving uh, which uh, upon receiving post to bookings uh, no query string headers is content type uh, application JSON What do I need now? Body is request body. And there are no matching rules. We'll respond with uh, 201 response body. And we say run. Yep. Ah, sorry. This is the end of interaction. We say run consumer test. What, so what happens here? Here we basically have created a stub. A stub that says expect this kind of request and provide this kind of response. And this thing will run a stub service in the background and give me the configuration of this stub service in this variable. So now I can create my, my client, drive to move. Is new drive to move. config base URL and give it an HTTP client. Um, we create a new booking request. Which says user123 and car123. Uh, we say what's the expected response. Booking response, booking one, two, three, and then we call our. Uh, what do I keep saying var instead of var? And then we call our service and see what's the actual response. Actual response is drive to move, book with a request and some magic, and we say actual response should be expected response. Okay. And now let's run this. So we do SBT. This is SBT for you. Take some time. Uh, ah. We do clean and we do vehicle booking test. Four sources? Oh, yeah, I did the clean. Oh, one failed. Mm. Uh, 
bookings. I will just run it from here. And now it succeeded. Okay, so our unit test is passing. Now the question is, why do we do this complicated way of stubbing? Why just not use Mokito or something like that and do this in one line? Well, the, the thing is that once you start using the packed framework, what you get as an output of uh, running the unit tests are contract files. So in the target packs folder, you will see something like this. So our interaction with the stub will be recorded as form the, as form of a, in form of a contract. Yeah. So I've been kind to you and wrote the contracts for BI and the mobile client separately. And now let's see how we do, how we use all of these in practice. So I will do another Docker Compose. There is a very nice component that comes from the packed framework. It's called the packed broker. So it's basically a repository of all of yours, uh, all of your contracts. So as soon as all this is running, we'll see how the packed broker looks like. Okay, so now it's listening at localhost 9000. So I've taken these interactions, these contracts, and uploaded, uploaded them to the packed broker, and you can see them here. You can click on, on, en on any of these and see the JSON files in a bit nicer format. Also, a cool thing is you can click on the provider and then see a graph of your services. So you see how each of the... Uh, your services is, is communicating to the, to the others. So I can click here and see the contracts between these, these two. Now this is very fancy, but you don't usually use it in practice. It's just to show off how fancy it looks. What this, this packed broker is really cool is that you can query it during your build pipelines, let's say. So when we are deploying the, the vehicle booking service, what we are saying is give me all the downstream dependencies of this service and we use them to stub the downstream dependencies. And then we say, give me all the consumers of this service, we take them and run all the interactions with the service, and we make sure that the service behaves the, the way it's supposed to behave. Uh, it's supposed to behave, sorry. Yeah. So let's see this in practice. This thing is running, I can say, let's hide this red thing. I can say CDC test. And what it has done, it has checked the contract between the mobile client and the vehicle booking, it has checked the contract between the BI and the vehicle booking, and it has checked the Swagger API definition. So you can take the Swagger API file and your contracts and see whether your service really behaves the way Swagger tells it behaves. So this is one way of keeping your Swagger documentation up to date. We don't like to generate the Swagger files from code because then it's very easy to change them. In this way, you have the documentation written separately and you have the consistency all the time. And uh, we have integrated this into our build pipelines and it's executed even actually when you open a pull request. So when you open a pull request, we run the service with all the dependency, run the contract, and then see if everything's running as it's supposed to run. Uh, this Swagger API definition check is provided by an uh, Atlassian library called Swagger Packed Validator, something like that, a combination of these three words. So this is for new services. Uh, what do you do with the old services? So we had the monolith, and we wanted to make sure that we don't break it. So what we did is we used Wiremock. Wiremock, among other things, can be used to recall the traffic. So we would put one Wiremock instance in front of the service, one wire mock after the legacy, and we will run all the possible requests that we can. This will be recorded, we then convert into packed files, and we have our incoming and outgoing contracts. And then, as we separate one provider, we just use these contracts to check if the provider is behaving as it should be. We told the bugs and, let's say, features and so on as the legacy system. So this is what the client expects to happen. And this, this has worked flawlessly for us. We split the whole monolith. It took us like six months. Nobody noticed that we were doing anything. And everything was just fine. 
Yeah, that's about it. If there are some questions or comments, thank you.